Good morning, saints, and welcome to our Sunday morning Bible study. Today we're continuing with our study of the Gospel of St. John, and we're continuing with Jesus battling uh, with his adversaries, the Pharisees. So if you will open up your Bibles to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 8, we'll be reading the last verse of chapter 7, verse 53. And then that leads us right into uh, leads us right into chapter eight. Uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we uh, ask your blessing upon us through your Holy Spirit, that you would teach us through your Holy Word what we need to live our lives of faith, and that is trusting in you and in your Word. That gives us light and helps us to live as witnesses of your death, resurrection, and salvation. In your precious name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So saints, once again, if you will open up your Bibles to the uh, Gospel of St. John, we're going to finish off with chapter 7, the last verse, verse 53. And then we're going to go on to uh, chapter 8. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 32. So we're going to cut chapter 8 in half. Uh, and uh, we're going to do the first half today. And then next Sunday, we will uh, do the second half of chapter 8. And we're reading from the uh, New International Version. So, and the theme is adultery and validity. The adultery, the woman caught in adultery, who the Pharisees will use to try to trick the Lord Jesus. And then it will go right into with the Pharisees questioning the validity of Christ as the Messiah. So let's begin with verse 53 of 7, and then we'll go right into uh, verse 1 of chapter 8. Then each one went to his own home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started writing on the ground with his finger. It, you know, saints, this is a really uh, famous passage. And if you watched any movies about our Lord, they always include uh, this passage from, from John. I think it's also mentioned in Mark. But we see here that First, we had this account of the woman caught in adultery. And, and, of course, the Pharisees went and found her, believe me. You see, as the festival ended and people headed for their homes, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, the Mount of Olives was where the Galileans always stayed for the Passover. You know, the Mount of Olives. It was a mountain, a little mountain grove. Uh, with olives, beautiful place. That's where the Garden of Gethsemane was. And that's where all the Galileans, when they came down from Galilee for the Passover, would stay. Well, the next morning, at the break of day, the Lord returned to the temple courts, as did many people from nearby. There he sat and he taught them. Meanwhile, the religious leaders tried to set a trap for our Lord so they could arrest him in spite of the many people learning from him. They had caught a woman in the act of adultery and dragged her to where Jesus was teaching. They made her stand before the group while they accused her and asked Jesus to pronounce judgment in view of the law of Moses. They state, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women, they asserted. Now what do you say? Now, here's the thing to remember, too, saints, that, yes, the law did say that not just the woman, but De uh, Deuteronomy 22, 13 to 24 and Leviticus 20, 10, the law clearly stated that both the man and the woman must die 
and death by stony is specifically mentioned only in the case of a virgin engaged to be married. So we see here they twisted this. There's no way of knowing whether this woman was a virgin. And secondly, they let the man go. So we know this was some kind of trick. Still, the Pharisees worked their evil scheme. If Jesus called for stoning, he would violate Roman law because only the Romans were permitted to execute people in their kingdom. If he said, let the woman go, he would violate the Mosaic law. So they were trying to trick the Lord, almost like, uh, remember when they came to him with the, uh, with the taxes? You know, good Lord, is it right for us to pay taxes? Okay. You, you know, if he says pay it, well, the people won't like that. If he says don't pay it, the Romans won't like it. And they have reasons to accuse him. But then remember what he said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, unto God what is God. And I'm sure their jaws just dropped. Now verse 7. When they kept questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Wow, he just cut him off there, didn't he? Jesus did not answer at first. He merely bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. We are given no hint of what he wrote. Eager to spin this, uh, spring their trap, the Pharisees kept pressing the Lord Jesus for an answer. Then the Lord spoke a sentence that is so well known and often repeated to this day. If any of you is without sin, cast the first stone. This text says, at her. You see, the Pharisees' actions here were three things. They were loveless. They were harsh. They were hypocritical. You see, I heard someone say about when the church does bad things, it said the preacher is pimping the pulpit and the people are hypocritical, are hypocrites in the pews. So, I mean, we see this same thing here in this church, this Old Testament church of Pharisees, not doing what was right as church leaders and not doing what was right totally as a people of God. And that were the Pharisees who were leading others to believe this stuff. You see, hatred prompted their little drama, but Jesus turned the trap back on them. Mosaic law called for the witnesses to throw the first stones in carrying out the death penalty. Now that's Deuteronomy 17, 7. So Jesus answered in part, if she is guilty, deserving death, do your job, you kill her. But Jesus put a twist on the thought that addressed a hateful hypocrisy. He said, do your job, kill her if you're without sin. You can kill her if you're perfect. You see, the words echoed his sentiments, which he expressed at the Sermon on the Mount. He said in Matthew 7, verse 3, also verses 1 through 5, he said, why do you look at the speck? of sawdust in your brother's eye, but pay no attention, neglect the plank that is in your own eye. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Only God can judge. Why? Because only God can see everything. Amen? Verse 8. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this those who heard began to walk away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, and I like this. Some, some texts say go and sin no more, but this text says it better. Go now and leave your life of sin. Or as I've said before, go now and don't deliberately sin again. But even if you do, we know we have forgiveness, but only if we're truly sorry. 
You see, as Jesus went back to writing on the ground, the Pharisees gradually slunk away. The older ones, quicker to get the point, went first. Soon after, the woman was left standing there alone with Jesus. And the Lord spoke to her, What happened to the witnesses who were condemning you? She said, There are none. Then I don't condemn you either, the Lord declared. But he added, Go now and leave your life of sin. You see, the Lord did not condemn, condone her sin, did he? He simply forgave it and called for repentance. Repentance means turning around. Don't do that again. He forgave it, called for repentance. Sin in any form, saints, is never justifiable. And the justified sinner trusting in his Lord or her Lord, will shun all sin. Now we go to the Lord Jesus testifying against the unbelievers. Verse 12. When Jesus spoke again in the temple or to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus here was again speaking in the presence of the Pharisees. Jesus spoke to all the people around him. He used that phrase, I am. He was repeating those words to let them know that he was identified with Yahweh. He says, I am the light of the world. Here was the Messiah telling those who would listen that he was a fulfillment of all that Isaiah had prophesied and the fulfillment of all that Isaiah had promised. Verse 2 of Isaiah, verse 9, is really a good Christmas text. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. In verse 1 of Isaiah, chapter 4, or pardon me, chapter 1 of Isaiah, verse 4, we learn that the Word had life in him, and that life was the light of men. Pardon me, that's not Isaiah, that's John. Jesus simply declared, I am again the light of the world. His light shines on life and gives life. His life penetrates the soul, and his light and life are one and one and the same in us. He walked in his light instead of the darkness inherent in this sin-corrupted world. We believe that and we live. Verse 13. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered. Even if I testify on my own behalf, My testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. You, but you, have no idea where I come from or where I am going. Previously, Jesus had offered other witnesses, such as John the Baptist, his works, Jesus' works, and God the Father. This time, he returned the challenge by insisting that his own testimony about himself was sufficient. It was sufficient because it was God's eternal truth. And Jesus knew who he was, where he came from, and where he was going. The Pharisees, on the other hand, did not know where he came from and did not know where he was going. They, not Jesus, had no basis to judge. Verse 15, the Lord continues. You judge by human understandings. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. You see, the Pharisees were ruled by their own reason, weren't they? And the sinful sinful inclinations of their corrupted hearts or nature. They judged the way people always judge without God. Meanwhile, any judgment Jesus made was supported by the one who sent him, who was the Father. 
Jesus knew the Old Testament teaching about two witnesses to confirm the truth. His truth was established by two. He witnessed about himself, and the Father who sent him also witnessed about him. Had the Pharisees truly knew or known and believed God's word, they would have had all the witnesses they ever needed. Verse 19. Then they asked him, Where is your father? You do not know me or my father, the Lord replied, for if you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area, pardon me, temple area near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his time had not yet come. Saints, the depth of the Pharisees' unbelief became clear. Where is your father, they challenged. Produce the second witness and make your case. You see, the eternal word made flesh stood before their very eyes. God from God testified to them, yet they refused to listen. The way to see the father is only through the son. And since they couldn't see the son, they couldn't see the father. We know his words troubled the hostile Jews, but they still did not capture him as they wished because his appointed time had not yet come. Jesus' work for our salvation, and even our work, continues to follow the Lord's timetable, not ours. Verse 21. Once more Jesus said to them, I am going away, and you will look for me, and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below. You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. Once again, the Lord Jesus tried to show the Jews how far off they were from the truth about him. Where he was going, they could not go. And this time Jesus added, however, something that clarified what he meant. He said, and you will die in your sins. Now those who do not believe in the Lord Jesus, saints, do not receive the forgiveness of sins. He has won for all of us. Those who have no forgiveness die in their sins. Those who die in their sins, well, they die forever. They do not have eternal life, and they cannot join the Lord Jesus in heaven. The Jews, however, did not catch this meaning. Their earthly way of thinking interfered. They wondered if he meant, if what he meant was to commit suicide, because that's the only way they couldn't come where he was going. Those Jewish leaders were from above, or for, pardon me, were from below from this world. Jesus was from above, not from this world. They were under the control of the prince of this world. Jesus was doing the will of his Father. And Jesus told them directly, you will die in your sins because you do not believe I am who I am. And whether they heard it that way or not, Jesus used the I am words again to identify himself. Verse 25. Who are you, they asked. Just what I have been claiming all along, the Lord replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is reliable, and what I've heard from him I tell the world. The hostile Jews challenged him again. They didn't believe it, so they asked for something they could believe. I've already told you, haven't I, the Lord replied. They have no answer, but it only sealed their judgment. And now verse 27. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be and that I do nothing on my own but speak what the father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. And even as he spoke, many put their faith in him. You see, the religious leaders of Pharisees couldn't see where Jesus was pointing them. They did not understand Jesus' 
uh, identify Jesus sender with the Father. Hardened in their unbelief, they would lift they would lift up the Son of Man, meaning crucify him. They would crucify him who embodied everything a man was supposed to be before sin ruined it all. He said, when I am lifted up on that cross, you will realize I am everything you want me to be. I am the I am. The Father sent Jesus to become a human like us saints, but he did not abandon Jesus in his humanity. And Jesus in his humanity never displaced, displeased the Father He lived in perfect sinfulness as our substitute. Other Jews, however, heard Jesus, and many of them went on to believe. Verse 31 and 32 are final verses. The Jews who had believed him, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Saints, Jesus spoke to those who believed while apparently the unbelieving Jews were listening too. The tender faith of these new believers needed strengthening for their faith to grow and for them to be truly Jesus' disciples. Jesus told them to hold to his teaching, to draw close to Jesus, to draw close to his word. They literally needed to remain in Christ, remain in his word, keep teaching there, keep learning there. But how did he make disciples? Well, the Lord taught them about himself. How did he keep disciples? He held them by his word. Okay. We still have Jesus' word today. That's what we're studying. And his word leads us to him and keeps us with him. The mark of any true follower, saints, is that they remain true to God's word. And where they learn the truth and the truth makes them free, they continue in it. What do we learn from Jesus today in this text? We learn that he is God sent from God to save us from sin. We learn that we have forgiveness with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we learn that Jesus leads us to our Heavenly Father. Those truths set us free. Free from the curse of sin, free from death, and free for eternal life. So, saints, that's our text for today, our Bible study. We've covered a little good amount of time there. I pray this was a blessing to you uh, and that it will strengthen and preserve our faith. If you hold on a little bit longer, in a few moments, uh, we will have our live stream worship service. So we ask you to stay and worship with us. If you're able, you can even come on Sunday mornings. At 11 o'clock for our worship services, the door opens up at 1030. And so now God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Amen. Hope to see you on Wednesday at 12 o'clock.